Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, uh, once again to uh, another holy and blessed Sabbath day. And I just want to take this opportunity to welcome those of you that are in here in the sanctuary with us. Also, those that might be uh, 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 tuning in and just had to step away for a quick second. And uh, just want to welcome you to God's Cathedral in time. Uh, as usual, and those of you that have been visiting with us, I usually would share a Sabbath nugget with you. I'm going to give you a very short one because what we'll be sharing today by God's grace has a lot to do with that and, and much more. Just want to say that it's great to be back and um, haven't been on here for about three weeks. I uh, took a little bit of uh, time off and uh, visited uh, my family back in my home country of uh, Guyana. Had a wonderful time and uh, glad to uh, be back. Our Sabbath nugget uh, today comes from the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 30, uh, 23. Leviticus chapter uh, uh, 33. Uh, 23 rather, and verse 3. And the Bible reads, Six days shall thou work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation means a coming together to go to church, if you, if you will. The Bible doesn't say that of any other day except the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So it's the Sabbath of the Lord. And as we come on the Lord's uh, Sabbath, we want to, to honor him. And we honor him by our coming together singing praises to him and studying his word, and just simply, simply reflecting his love to those that we come into contact with. You know, uh, Sabbath is practice time. As we come into the holy convocation and we express and display love for each other, and as we go out during the week, then that which we have practiced becomes a reality in our lives as we encounter our, our friends, our neighbors, uh, those in the grocery store, in our jobs, or wherever. Uh, let us pray as we begin this morning. Father, we thank you once again for your uh, great love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you. Our lips cannot, dear Father, have enough words to thank you for your great love in sending your Son, Christ Jesus. It, in, it is in his name that we come this morning asking that you would bless us, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would edify us. Be with your, your man servant in a very special way. Give me the thoughts to think and the words to say, that your people would be edified, that we all would be glorified, and that as we leave this place, we would be drawn closer to thee to reflect your glory to those we come into contact with. Is my prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen, amen. and amen. You know, there is uh, a lot of confusion and uh, debate in the world, but I want to address that confusion and conflict in a particular way in uh, a Christendom. That includes everyone that calls themselves a, 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 a Christian. A couple of those are, are debates and confusion that we, we hear about. It's about the new covenant and the old covenant. What is the old covenant? What is the new covenant? People have all kinds of ideas. And we as a people, as God's people, I think it's very important that we do understand, that we do understand what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the old covenant and the new covenant, part of the conversation that surrounds that, uh, is part of that discussion, is whether we should keep God's law or not, that some think that the old covenant was just for the old people, the, 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 the Jewish people. And then others believe that we, when we accept Christ, 
we don't have to, to keep his law, and that is the new covenant. Let me just say here, and I'll expand more on it as we go along. Think with me for a moment. Are there laws in your home? You don't have to answer uh, openly, just think about it. Are there laws in your home? Are there laws in the county or the city in which you live? Are there laws that you must abide by in the state that you live? Are there laws in the country in which you reside that you must abide by? My question this morning is that if there are laws and you have to abide by these laws, how could someone come to the conclusion, this is really beyond my pay grade, that when we accept Jesus Christ, we no longer have to keep God's law. My dear brothers and sisters, our very existence as human beings is based on law. As a matter of fact, everything around us is based on law. The automobile that you drive is based on law, on mathematical laws that they had to apply in, and uh, uh, engineering laws or what have you. Everything that we do operates on the basis of law. So I think it's very ridiculous for someone to claim that because they have accepted uh, uh, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that they no longer need to keep God's law. Let me deal first with the issue of the covenant and all of this would be uh, uh, intertwined. What is a covenant? What is a covenant? A covenant, it's uh, simply an agreement between two parties. It suggests that an offer or a proposition is made by one party to the other, and the other agreed to abide by the terms of that agreement and the conditions of that proposition. And once they agree, then they seal it. They agree to it. They put their signatures on it or what, by whatever other means they decided that they would seal that covenant or, a, or agreement. In fact, they ratify it, make it valuable, make it effective and, and make it workable by ratifying the terms of that agreement. When you get a bank loan or you open an account, they send you a, a bunch of papers which most of us have no clue what they're talking about, but we sign it anyway because we ratify it to show that we agree with the terms and conditions. You know, even as that thought come to my mind, how ridiculous it would be for us to say that God has no law and uh, therefore we could do whatever we want. You don't do that with your bank, you don't do that with your landlord, you don't do that with the car dealer, but oh, we could do it to God. How ridiculous that notion. From the perspective of God's uh, 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 covenant, and we must understand and realize that this is exactly what is taking place. God has given us the covenant and the terms of, those, of that covenant is his uh, uh, Ten Commandment law. My dear brothers and sisters, oh yes, the so-called Old Covenant was given to the Jews, the Jewish people, but why did, God, why did God give it to them? Again, another example. How many of you have had a, 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 a blood test? Do they draw all of your blood out of your body and examine the blood and then make a determination as to whether you have a, a disease or some condition exists? No. They take a small portion and then they examine it and they give you the results. And so it is with God. He chose a group of people. We chose one man to begin with, uh, Abraham. And then through Abraham's descendants who came to be known as the Jews to reveal to them who the true God is. But it was not just for themselves. 
it was for them to share God's glory, to reflect to the world the character of the true God, to let the world know who the true God is so that they may come and worship him. And so the prophet Isaiah writes in the book of Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6, and there are other places also. The Bible reads, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness, talking about the nation of Israel, and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and will give thee for a covenant of the people for a light unto the Gentiles. So why did God make this covenant with Israel? It's for them to come to understand who he is, to follow the terms of the covenant which is his uh, 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 Ten Commandments and also his other laws. We'll touch on those uh, 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 briefly. And so as they do that, they would now reflect to the entire world, the Gentiles, as it is called, who the true God is. So people would know who he is and to worship him in spirit and in truth. My dear brothers and sisters, the old covenant as we seem to call it, and that's man's invention, is, was not only for the Jews. It was given to them for them to share with the rest of the world. We find in the book of, of Exodus chapter 19, Moses, having delivered the people through God's power from Egyptian bondage, and they're now in Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up into the mountain to, to meet with God on behalf of the people. And God gives to Moses the, the terms the, of that covenant, the, the conditions, if you will, of that covenant. And in Exodus chapter 19, Moses now returned to the people. And in a thunderous uh, uh, exemplification, if you will, or demonstration of God's power. God gave Moses the law. And Moses now comes down and he reads it to the people, he gives it to the people, he has the Ten Commandments that were written in stone uh, out to the people and he presents it to them. And then in Exodus chapter 19 and um, verse 5, Moses says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice in thee, God speaking through Moses, and keep my covenant, keep my covenant, keep my laws, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. My dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know this morning that the people of Israel, the Jewish people as it were, the people to which God had now given his covenant. As a matter of fact, if you really want to get a little deep into this, and I really don't want to, but that covenant was given way back in Genesis after man sinned. God is just reiterating what he had given to uh, uh, Adam. And, but that's a different subject for a different day. But with regards for our discussion today, the people responded to God's covenant because God required them that they should live by these, uh, uh, the terms of this covenant, of this uh, uh, agreement. And so the people responded in the book of Exodus, same chapter 19 and verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, and all that the Lord had spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. In other words, not that God didn't know, but Moses says, uh, well, God, I've given it to them as you have asked me, and they decided that they are going to, to, keep, to keep your covenant. But what are the terms of that covenant? I want to deal today in a very specific way with the terms of the covenant that does not only apply to the Jewish people to which it was given for them to share with the rest of the world, but for all humanity throughout all the ages. 
And we find the terms of that uh, uh, covenant in the book of Exodus. I love the Bible. It's a precious book. There's no book like the Bible. And so now, I want to read to us the words of the covenant. It's found in the book of Exodus chapter 20. And this is what the Bible says. He says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. My dear brothers and sisters, we are all in bondage. We are all in bondage to sin. And the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus who declared. He says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He declared, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish uh, but have everlasting life. And just as the Jews were delivered out of Egyptian bondage, a symbol of sin, and God now gives them his covenant and he says, this is how I want you to live. This is how I want you to live with each other. This is how I want you to live with me. So it is. When we accept Jesus Christ and he delivers us from sin, the covenant, the terms of the covenant, it's exactly the same. And so Moses goes on to write. And as I read this morning, not my own opinion, the word of God, I want you to think seriously which one of these terms you don't think you need to abide by since you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Item number one, or term number one, Thou shalt have no other God before me. Amen. Term or item number two, clause number two in the covenant. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt, now bow down, thou shalt not bow down thyself to serve them for I, the Lord, am God, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I want you to know this morning, the Bible predicted that there would be a power that would come along and that would claim the prerogative of being able to change God's law. And I want you to know this morning that that power exists upon the earth claiming to be Christian. And that power has done exactly what God had prophesied that it would do, yeah, attempt to change his law. In a very specific way, this commandment has completely been removed from God's covenant so that the people are taught that they must bow down to idols and worship idols completely contrary to what God says. My dear brothers and sisters, term number three of the covenant, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold them guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We are living in some serious times and those of us that call ourselves Christians, we need to take heed because decisions have to be made. My question is this morning, should we or shouldn't we? Should we or shouldn't we live and abide by God's law? God continues the fourth term of the covenant which the entire world just about, the entire Christian world has a problem with. My dear brothers and sisters, that very power that had removed the second term of the covenant, that same power that had completely gone against God and removed that commandment that says we should not worship idols, that power also has twisted the fourth term of the covenant and made it into something completely that neither God nor Jesus Christ 
nor the prophets, nor the apostles knew anything about. And here is that fourth term of the covenant. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, not the Sabbath of the Jews. The Jews don't have a Sabbath. The Christians don't have a Sabbath. I don't have a Sabbath, and you don't have a Sabbath. The only Sabbath that God recognizes is his Sabbath. We call it the seventh day of the week, Amen. better known today as, as, as Saturday. Amen. And he continues, In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maid servant, nor thy man, uh, man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle that is within, nor the, the nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days, this is why we keep the seventh day Sabbath, my dear Christian friends. My dear Christian friends, those of you that are listening, that for whatever reason, you have been told that we ought not to keep God's Sabbath, that it's been replaced by the first day of the week. I want you to know that that is deception. The whole world might be doing it, but that does not make it right. But Jesus says in the book of Matthew, Matthew the seventh chapter and beginning at verse 13. And this is what Jesus says to us. He says that straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leadeth. And, and uh, let me start over. Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that find it, that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So the fact that most of the Christian world is substituting a day, under the direction and inspiration of the man of sin that has told them that God's Sabbath only belonged to the Jews, a precept which is not found in the Bible, and therefore they must keep the day that they prescribe. Oh, and they were so cunning to say that because Jesus rose on the first day of the week, then we ought to keep Sunday. Show me in the Bible where God says because Jesus rose on Sunday that we should keep a day in honor of his resurrection. Show me in the Bible where the Lord says that we should keep Sunday uh, because God has replaced his seventh day Sabbath which was of the Jews and now we are Christians so we keep Sunday. I want you to know this morning if you're attending a church that is teaching that era God is saying to you even now, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her plagues. And the plagues, it's not a pretty picture. I invite you to read the book of Revelation chapter 16 to, to get an idea of what those plagues are. But anyway, coming back to the covenant, the Bible says as we continue to read, the fifth covenant, now the first four that we read has to do with how we worship God. We have no other God before him. We put nothing between ourselves and our Savior. We don't put anything, our belongings, our education. We don't put Mary between ourselves and our Savior. Thou shalt have no other God. Uh, before me. Amen. The second one, thou shalt not make any idols. Oh no, we don't pray to any idols. We don't kiss the feet and the, and the rings of men. Oh no, my dear brothers and, and, and sisters, we don't pray to idols, we don't pray to beads. Hello. Because the Bible calls them idols. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible continues that we shall not call his name in vain. When you say you love God and you refuse to keep his commandments, you are in fact claiming his name in vain. 
And he says to you this morning that you are to stop, that you are to abide by the terms of his covenant, which he had given to Moses and the Israelites to share to the rest of the world, to you and I, particularly those of us that have come to these uh, closing scenes of Earth's history. Clause number six in the covenant. Number five, honor thy mother and thy father that thy days may be long upon the earth on which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I was having a conversation the other day with some friends of mine and I was telling them growing up, you seldom hear of young people dying. When you hear of a young person dying, it were a rarity. Well, back in those days, the young people respected their parents. They respected adults. I remember going into my home country, which I just came back from 20 years, 20 something years ago, myself and my dear wife. And when she got there, she was quite surprised because all the little children in the neighborhood came up to her and began to call her auntie. Auntie, good morning, auntie. Good afternoon, auntie. She says, wow, what is this? Because the children respected their parents, but now, but now the young people are dying. They're dying from so-called gunshot woods and their wounds, and they're dying from all kinds of diseases, and young people are just dying. I want to let you know this morning is because they have disrespected their parents because that's what the Bible says. When you respect your parents, you would live for a long time. But when you don't, you shall die. You see, God's word is sure. And men are trying with all their science and so-called science and, and studio science and all their education to solve the problems of the world. But I want you to know this morning, the world has only one problem, and that problem is sin. And the only solution for the problem is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You could say that you love Jesus all you want, but you're, you're not striving by his grace to keep all of his commandments. You're calling his name is vain. And your love for him is not love, it's hypocrisy. I gotta preach the gospel straight. I didn't come to entertain you this morning or to tickle your ears. Term number six, it says, it says, term number six, thou shalt not kill. I'm gonna go through the rest of these quickly. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Your neighbor is making a half a million dollars a year, and they drive a Lamborghini. Oh, but you are so covetous in your heart. You're only making 20,000. You might not be able to get a Lamborghini, but you go and you put yourself in death to get a car that you have to work three or four jobs so that you'll be able to pay for it. It's called covetousness. And God says that we shall not covet anything that is our neighbors. My dear brothers and sisters, this covenant that God has given to us, he wants us to, to keep it. My brothers and sisters, the Bible continues in the book of Exodus chapter 24. Moses talking about God's covenant. The Bible says, and Moses came and told the people all the words that the Lord of the Lord and his judgments and the people answered with one voice, all the words which the Lord had said we will do. And Moses worked all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and with 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm in Exodus 24 verses three and four. According to the 12 tribes of Israel, 
And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrifices of peace of oxen unto the Lord. And so the covenant that was given to God's people back in the time of Moses, it was ratified by the blood of animals. It was written on tables of stone by the finger of God, and it was ratified by the blood of animals. But I want you to know uh, this morning that as we come to the so-called new covenant, that the terms and the conditions are the same. Let me read a few more verses and then we'll talk a little bit about that new covenant or so-called. And he, Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that we will do, we will do, and so on. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord made with you concerning these words, these commandments, these terms of the covenant. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning, I want you to know that we are instructed in God's word, that his Ten Commandments are the divine pattern by which we should order our lives. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning, the problems that we're having in the world is because men and women, yea, even some that call themselves Christians and children of God are living outside of the terms of the covenant, my dear brothers and sisters, and because of that, we're seeing the baleful results in the society in which we live. What if men would have heeded to God, and thou shalt not kill? Then we wouldn't have any murder, any needs for the court system, and maybe the police. What would young people would honor their mothers and their fathers as God commanded? Then we wouldn't be going to the funerals of so many young people. They wouldn't be killing each other because by simply honoring God's covenant, God would have protected them and work on their minds so that they would do the right thing and as he promised to preserve their lives. What if we would not steal from each other? And I'm talking about from the large corporations to the pickpocket on the street. What a society we would be living in. What a society we would be living in if there was no covetousness in the hearts of men. Oh yes, brothers and sisters, this is the solution for the problems that we have in the world today. My dear brothers and sisters, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4, this is what the Bible says, and beginning in verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord thy God which I commanded you. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire, as I said earlier, you could go back and read it. It was very thund thunderous when God gave his commandments. And listen to this. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even his ten commandments, and he wrote them on tables of stone. How clearer could God be? How clearer could God be? My dear brothers and sisters, within that covenant, God has placed his seal. What is a seal? I'm talking to you from the United States of America. In the United States of America, in order for something to become law, the Congress, the, the lower house and the upper house, the House of Representatives and and the senators, they agree to a particular law. That law has no value 
it has no value until the president assigns his signature to it. My question this morning, did God put his signature on his law? Amen. Well, let's check and see what the Bible says. Exodus 31 verses 6 and 7. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. I don't know how many of you are into paintings, uh, Van Gogh, Gauguin, or whoever. Those pictures, those paintings have no value until the signature of the artist is attached to it. And so God painted us the most beautiful picture that has ever been painted. In the creation story, the creation of this world with all its, its magnificence and, and beauty. And the Bible tells us that in six days he painted that picture. And then on the seventh day he attached his, his signature. And if we go to the book of Genesis, the second chapter, we would find God's signature on his picture of creation. And the Bible reads, and Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which he had created and, and made. Those of you this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, why would you want to reject something that God has sanctified? My mind can't comprehend that. But most of the Christian world, as I speak to you this morning, in the love of God, in the love of God, has rejected that which God has given to us. I want to let you know that if you reject the Sabbath, you're in fact saying to yourself that you reject God. Because he says this is the identification. This is the seal of the covenant. Coming back to that seal of the United States of President Biden, it has three elements to it. He signs it. It has his name, Joe Biden. It has the territory over which he rules the United States, and it has his title, the president. My dear brothers and sisters, so it is with the Sabbath commandment. It has the name, the Lord thy God. It has his title, the creator. Amen. And it has the territory over which he rules the entire universe. Amen. Someone this morning, I pray by God's grace, would come to understand that the keeping of the Sabbath is not just a theological issue or a choice that we just, well, it's always a choice. God gives us the power of choice here to choose even against him. It's not a good choice. But my brothers and sisters uh, this morning, those of you that for whatever reason have not accepted God's Sabbath, he's saying to you uh, this morning, come closer to me. If you love me, listen to what I'm saying. Be obedient to me. My dear brothers and sisters, so many claim that the law and particularly the Sabbath are, are just for the Jews. But let's see what the Word of God says as he speaks through his a servant Paul in the book of Romans, the second chapter, and we look at verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, 
and not of the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. What is Paul saying? You're not a Jew because you're of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're a Jew because of if you love God and you keep his commandments, that's what he is saying. My dear brothers and sisters, Paul continues to tell us in the book of Galatians chapter 3 and 21, 29, if ye be of Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So many of us want to claim the promises of God, but we don't want to keep his obligations. Well, it's a package deal. You're only deluding yourself if you want just to claim the, the benefits of God, but not abide by his covenant. My dear brothers and sisters, we hear a lot of this so-called new covenant, and let's take a look in God's word and see what this so-called new covenant consists of. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verses 7 to 10, and Paul is actually quoting from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, uh, 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 chapter 25 he says chapter 33 he says for if the first covenant had been faultless then should no place have been sought for the second now there was nothing wrong with God's law there was absolutely nothing wrong with God's law in the so called first covenant God's law is perfect, the Bible tells us, converting the soul. The problem was with the people who says that they will keep their part of the agreement. And so Paul is saying that since the people did not keep the law based on the letter of the law as was given to them by God through Moses, so God in his love and his mercy. I love God, don't you? Amen. He now says, I'm going to give you a new way. I'm going to reveal to you a new way. This has always been God's desire. For those of us that have studied the sanctuary, it has always been God's desire for us to have faith in him. So Paul continues in the book of Hebrews. For finding fault with them, the Israelites, God said, it was not with the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. There was no need to put away the Ten Commandments, but the fault was with the people. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, said the Lord. But praise God. But praise God. Paul continues, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. Now listen to this particularly those of you who claim that the new covenant, we don't have to keep God's law. This is what the Bible says. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. The old covenant was written on tables of stone. God is saying to you and to I today, I want to write my heart, my laws on your heart. The Bible tells us that the Lord declares, For I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are consumed. In other words, I have changed my law. Because of my love and my mercy, I have now given you an opportunity to be able to keep it. The blood that was shed 
when Moses gave the covenant, the blood that was shed throughout the Israelites' journey, the blood of the animals was shed, the blood in the sanctuary, it was all pointing to the blood that Jesus Christ was shed, has shed for our sins on Calvary's cross. He didn't die that cruel death so that we should continue in sin as so many preach. He did it because we should have the power to overcome sin in our lives. Paul says in Romans, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, Then verily the first covenant hath also ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. Then he continues, same chapter, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make them that did the service perfect pertaining to the conscience. In other words, it was just a type of the blood that would be shed on Calvary's cross and so when uh, John, the forerunner of Jesus Christ as he was baptizing them, the people preaching the gospel of repentance, which is the same gospel that Jesus preached and the apostles preached, turn away from your wicked ways. And then he raised up his head one day and he saw this individual which was, who was dressed pretty much like the, the farmers and the fishermen and the lowly people of that town in which they lived in Galilee. But there was something different about him. There was something about the way he walked, there was something about the aura around him and the Holy Spirit revealed to John. And John would write in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 29, Behold, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, the Old Covenant ratified by the blood of animals, the terms of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, written on stone. The New Covenant, the terms of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, written in our hearts. The Old Covenant ratified by the blood of animals, which could not take away our sins, pointing to Jesus and the New Covenant my dear brothers and sisters, ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Paul would write in the book of 2 Corinthians and the fifth, uh, 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 fifth chapter, Paul now tells us about what happens when we accept uh, 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 Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and verse 21. Now Paul writes, For he, God, had made him, Jesus Christ, to be blood, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when we accept Jesus Christ, you can't accept Jesus Christ and at the same time, out of the same lips, say you don't have to keep God's law. The purpose of accepting Jesus Christ is so that he would manifest his righteousness and his righteousness is his law in our lives. Paul writes again in the book of Romans, the book of Romans, the eighth chapter. You see, Christianity is a thinking man's religion. It's not a parroting religion to listen to what men say. But Jesus says, search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me, Paul writes. And he tells us that we may, should study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. More people need to study the scriptures for themselves rather than listening to the parroting of error of their so-called leaders. So Paul writes in the book of Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation 
to them which are in Christ Jesus. Why? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The law is a spiritual thing. For the law of the spirit of life is Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? It's my thing. Do whatever you want. I don't have to keep the law. That's what the law of sin and death is. The Bible continues. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak to the flesh, and the Israelites experienced that because they tried in their own strength to keep the law, and they failed. It wasn't the law that failed. It was the people that failed. And so Paul continues, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. How plain could the Bible be? My Christian friends, Salvation is all about law keeping. When Joseph was about to put away Mary because she was found with child and he didn't have relationships with her, the angel appeared to him and said that she should not, he should not put her away for she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus and he shall save us from our sins. My dear brothers and sisters, as we begin to bring this to a, to a close, I want us to be mindful this morning. The question that was asked as we begin is, should we or shouldn't we? If you haven't gotten the answer yet, I'll give it to you. The answer is yes, we should. The only way to show your love for God is to keep his commandments. He says in, through his servant John, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, John the Revelator. Looking down through the corridors of time to the age in which we live as the, this world is coming to an end, that this world is on a collision course with its destiny of destruction. But this is what John writes, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter into that city, that holy city, the Jerusalem. My dear brothers, and sisters, I want to let you know this morning that everything that God is, his law is. So when you reflect, reject God, God's law, you're rejecting God. The Bible tells us very clearly, let me get to it, and just read a quick few passages for you. It tells us that God is good. I'll just give you the scripture references, Luke 18 and 19. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.8 that the law is good. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 5.16 that the law is holy. In the book of Romans 12, it tells us that the law is holy. In Matthew 5 and 48, the Bible tells us that the law is perfect. In Psalms 19 and 7, the Bible teaches us that the law is perfect. In the book of 1 John 3 and 2, the Bible tells us that God is pure. In Psalms 19 and 7, it says that the law is pure. Deuteronomy 32, 4 tells us that God is just. In Romans 12, in Romans 7 and 12, it tells us that the law is just. John 3.33 tells us that God is true. In Psalms 19 and 9, it says that the law is true. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 23 and 6 and other places 
that God is righteous. Psalms in 119 and 172 tells us that the law is righteous. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. Romans 13, 10 tells us that God is love. In the book of James chapter 1 and verse 17, it says that God is unchangeable. In Matthew 5, 18, it says that the law is unchangeable. The Lord Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 30, 21 and verse 33 that God is eternal. Psalms tells us, Psalms 1, David tells us in the Psalms 111, 7 and 8, that the commandments, the law, is eternal. This may be a wake-up call for some and reinforcement, a refresher for others. Whatever situation you find yourselves in, God has asked me to pass by and tell you this morning that, that Jesus is coming soon. And the only ones that would be saved in his kingdom is those that keep his commandments against uh, 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 that keep his commandments by his grace. I'm not talking about salvation by works. We don't work to keep, to, 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 to be saved. But because we're saved, we want to do what God asks us to do. You're married, you have your wife, you have your husband. You don't do good things to them just for them to love you. You go, go do good things for them because you love them. A husband does good things for his wife, and a wife does good things for her husband because they love them. Love manifests itself in action. There is no love without action. Faith without works is dead. And so the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments, abide by the covenant. Talk to your preacher tomorrow. Those of you who have not been aware or have been taught that you ought not to keep God's commandment, particularly his Sabbath, the very one that he sets as a seal. We're in a warfare. That's the work of the enemy. My brothers and sisters, many may be deceived, but God is calling you today to be undeceived. My dear brothers, and sisters, this old world is, is coming to an end because that's what the prophecy predicts. The condition of the world today, it says, exactly as Jesus and the other prophets and Daniel the prophet and John the revelator and Isaiah, they all talked about the condition of the world, the condition that the world would be in just before Jesus comes. I want you to know this morning that the man of sin is gathering all the nations of the world, is gathering all the Christian denominations of the world, all the religions of the world, all the businesses of the world, and is bringing them together just as the book of Revelation chapter 17, and I'll close with that, declares to war against those that keep the commandments of God. And in Revelation chapter 17, as we close, I read, beginning in verse 9, And here is the man that hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sit, the woman in Bible prophecy, refers to a ecclesiastical or church entity. The Bible says that this particular woman sits upon seven heads or seven mountains. And then the Bible continues in verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Ten is a perfect number, complete number, number of completion in the Bible talking about ten kings, it is talking about all the nations of the world. You don't have to believe the Bible, just look around and see what's happening. Is the world being gathered together by a particular entity, the Roman papacy, that sits on seven hills 
The Pope of Rome is saying, let's all come together for climate change. Let's all come together on Honor Sunday to mitigate the desecration of the earth now. The desecration of the earth has not come about because men and women fail to keep Sunday. It has come about because men have sinned and gone against God's law. But the whole world, the Bible says, will be wandering after the beast, all the religious powers, all the political powers, all the economic powers are coming together. And the Bible says, our 10 kings which have received no kingdom yet, but received one power, one hour, with the beast. And then the Bible declares, these all have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And if you don't see it developing yet before your eyes, I want to let you know that it's being, that it's taking place even as I speak. It's in the public domain. You get opportunity, go online and download the last two encyclicals of Pope Francis, Laudato Si, where he's calling for Sunday sacredness to fight climate change. And we'll be hearing more and more of that all around us. And then his next encyclical, Fatuli Septiti, I think it is, where he is calling for one world order under the auspices of the Pope of Rome. God knew all of this was coming, and so he forewarned us we are there. And the Bible says, These shall make war with the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? The Lamb is Jesus Christ. He is not here in person. But those of us that claim to be his followers, the war would be made against us. These shall make war with the Lamb. Praise God, the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. God is calling you this morning to come on the side of the Lamb. My dear brothers and sisters, should we or shouldn't we? Yes, we should. Because all of those that are on the side of the Lamb will be following the Lamb. And the Lamb came and lived upon this earth and kept all of his Father's commandments. He who had no sin, God had made him sin for us. We have such a high priest who cannot be touched with the, who, uh, with the, we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted yet without sin. And sin is breaking the commandments of God, including his Sabbath. So if you plan on being on the Lord's side, on the side of the Lamb, then you must be, by his grace, keeping all of his commandments. As I close this morning, I pray that today, that this message has gotten to the heart of someone, someone to strengthen them in the faith that they have in Jesus and his laws, and someone else who loved the Lord, but had not known that this is what the Lord requires and why he requires it. The Lord says that his word will never return unto him void, but it would achieve the mission for which it is proclaimed that goes forth, and that is for the salvation of men's souls. And so this day I pray that some soul has been touched and that some heart may be changed as a result of what the Lord has spoken to us today, yea, even through this worthless piece of clay. God bless you. And enjoy the rest of God's cathedral of time, his holy and blessed Sabbath day. Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together in the holy convocation, just as you have instructed us, whether here in the sanctuary in person or whether online because of the circumstances of the times in which we live. I pray, dear Lord, that you would heal all of those that have been afflicted by this coronavirus, that you would encircle the rest of us that have not been touched and, and protect us, dear Father. I pray that soon and very soon that someone 
may come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Maybe someone listening on this line today who has never known you as their Lord and Savior, that they may come to accept you and give their lives to you for you're a faithful God. It doesn't take you a month, a year. It doesn't take you 10 years to save us. You save us in an instant. I think of the thief on the cross. The moment that he recognized and accepted you as the Lord, as his Lord and Savior, you declare that he is saved, that he will be in your kingdom. He hasn't changed. So Lord, I pray that you would do that for someone this morning, that they would in humility and contrite spirit just give their lives to you. Someone that may be struggling with just the things of life, decisions to be made. Help them to make the most important decision is to give their lives to you and experience the manifest transformation that you would bring about in their lives. Help them to experience the peace and the comfort that you would give them. For you have promised my peace, peace I give unto you. My peace I leave with you, not as the world give it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let neither be afraid. Accept Jesus today. Accept him in his in your life. And experience the peace that he has promised. The comfort that he has promised. And more importantly, eternal life with him in his soon coming kingdom. Is my prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. God bless you all.